Good afternoon, CUBE community, and welcome back to Databricks Data and AI Summit. We're here in San Francisco. My name is Savannah Peterson for theCUBE. Very excited to be closing out our two days of power-packed coverage with a fantastic foursome. Rob, Howie, and John, thank you so much for <laughs> hanging out. Love it. I feel like the bell of the nerd ball right now. It's, it's, a, wonderful, <laughs> it's a wonderful feeling. Oh, don't sell yourself short on that. <laughs> you're, 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 you're in the nerd fam, that, there's no doubt. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Rob. It's nice to have you on the desk. I've missed you this yeah. week. Well. And they've been had busy you, sequestered yes. over in the analyst Had you quarantined uh, wing. over yes, there with all quarant the <laughs> Not quarantined, sequestered. There's no yeah. quarantine going on. So, <laughs> so I want, I'm going to open with you actually because I'm curious. We've had two totally different experiences. How's it been for you over there in the analyst I, I think it's been really interesting seeing them deep dive into where they are today, where they're going in the future, some of which is under NDA and I can't get into. But I think, again, the success that they're having within the accounts to bring those who've started with them on the data science side over to the Databricks SQL side and expand inside those accounts has been really fascinating and the growth rate that they have is just unbelievable. 60% growth rate, you know, that's at a $2.4 wow. billion dollar ARR, that's amazing. That's super not, impressive. Not, not too many companies can claim that. Yeah, no wonder they are claiming it. I'd be shouting that from the rooftops if that's where I was. What, a, what yeah. an exciting time to be there, my goodness. Howie, this is our first time getting to sit on the desk together at the show, and in particular, nice to see you. Good, great what, to be here. Yeah, what, what have you learned? What's been your, some of your key takeaways? Well, I just wandered around the floor a little bit. I mean, data is the gold mine, as Jensen Huang said, right? Uh, the problem with data is it's it's mine, you know, it's it's gold, but it, it it's it's pretty tough to mine it. Right. Right. You know, it's always easy to you know have a PowerPoint slide to say you know hey here's the all the reports, but when people really do it, it's always a lot of work. Right. Governance, security, you know, silos, and then who owns what. Right. Yeah. Data lineage, compliance, dedupe. I mean, all sorts of problems. So yeah. I see so many companies solving so many problems. So it's kind of a it's a renaissance. <laughs> it, it, it is a renaissance, it's great. It's, it's definitely a really unique time. John, we've had the pleasure yeah. of interviewing a lot of great guests on the show. I mean, Who was your favorite? Well, Not I that we have to pick a favorite child, but. Well, I mean, I mean, they all brought a little bit different game to the table. Joel, the from Databricks, actually gave the Databricks perspective. It had some customers. I really like Excel Data because they're doing the data pipelines. I'm fascinated with the data pipelines, as yeah. I pointed out, data's messy. But you start to see kind of in the neural network kind of vein, not directly, but like, Data pipelines will become very important because separating compute from data will allow to, the ability to support diversity of workloads and, and various engines, whether it's compute engines, whatnot. So what that means is a lot of different things that, are, that was once diverse and messy can now be connected. And that's going to enable programmatic cool things. So I think that's a trend that I love and that came out in that interview. But Databricks brought game this thing. They brought uniform uh, general availability on the Delta they Lake. They brought game, baby. U Unity catalog, open source. Mosaic AI adding more tools, lake flow that on the pipelines, and then serverless, taking away all the infrastructure so there's no knobs and clusters to manage. So they're starting to kind of, I want to say grow up a little bit and, and get to the out of the command line. There's a maturity though. Command line, data, data developer, nerd to, okay, scale, simplicity, value at the business level. So I think they're going right down the right path. So, I mean, it was a great set of interviews. Last year they bought a Mosaic ML, this year they bought a Tabula, so they seem to be doing yeah. well on the M&A side, right? Yeah. They are leveraging that point, tool uh, yeah. pretty well, even though they are a private company. Usually it's the public company, companies doing that. But well, it's a with a valuation company, of over 45 billion on paper, they got a lot of, Rob, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of powder to work with, so to speak, in terms yeah. of equity. That's one way I to mean, put it. I mean, I think Snowflake and Databricks are going to be competing. If Databricks makes product advancements, Snowflake goes on the M&A front. They make an M&A move over at Databricks, Snowflake's going to respond. So we're going to see that back and forth. Yeah, yeah I mean, at the end of two weeks of data weeks, two weeks of it, you, know, <laughs> I, you start to look at how these two are really going head to head, and you know, I don't want to say tit for tat with the announcements, but when you start to look at, hey, I mean, there was a direct shot across the bow uh, when he said, sure. what, you know, when Matei goes up there and pushes and makes the repo public for Unity right there and then on stage, versus in 90 days for Polaris, I, that's, a, that's a direct, I mean, that was, it's that a, was, it's a that was a direct yeah. frontal, <laughs> right. you know, humiliation And it point. was a move for the community. Yeah. I think it was a real moment of, of it, uniting it, people, I mean, pun intended, but I, I thought that was a special moment, and I think anytime. Oh, it was yeah. a nice shot that Snowflake right through the arm, 
bullet yeah. through the arm. Hey, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> 90 yes. days. How about like now? This is how we feel about <laughs> yes. 90 days. Yeah, 90 days. We feel it should be instant. Yeah. yeah. I think it's more than that. It's, you know, both of them, they are open. I mean, they, they wanted to have an open community. Then the question is, you know, if as a developer, where do I go, right? Maybe there's another open community that's yeah. on top of both of them, right? So, so I, you know, I actually wrote up on the LinkedIn yesterday, you know, there are companies, open source projects, they are more vendor neutral. Potentially, possibly, they have more advantage. Yeah, and I, I think, again, it, it, when we talk to them, you know, again, over in our little nerd fest in their sequestered area, you know, I mean, part of it is, how do they go after verticals they haven't necessarily been strong in? And I think mm -hmm. they've done good at, you know, for instance, at the credit union and fintech yeah. level, but how do they get into the hardcore yeah. banking aspect of things? Where Snowflake has historically been really, really strong, I think they're bringing a lot of features to yeah. bear to be a more complete solution, and I think that is definitely a way that they've seen, and you know, again, Ali talked about it, hey, I heard from 100, you know, hundred CIOs, I, we need, you know, lake flow, and I need to be able to bring my da data from SFDC and from Salesforce yeah. into here to join that up with this other, to make my intelligence and my AI internally so I can answer these queries. That to me is, again, looking at what other personas and what are other customers in TAM, and I hate the word TAM, but going after which TAM yeah. do I go and pull well, in? Well, no, they, they, have, they have a big TAM because they got data engineering and BI and, and SQLs for writers, right? So yeah. like, that's yeah. key. Now, the question is, is that Rob, like Snowflake, they do a really easy way to get into the platform. They got a compute engine built in. It's easy to develop and to deploy apps, data apps on Snowflake. Now, the question is, is that, you know, Databricks has got much more robust flexibility, but it might, the ease of use might have be more like an iPhone. You know, okay, it's easy, it's all right there. Databricks yeah. might have a better architectural solution and more horsepower, but will they move down? But I, mean, yeah. I think they coexist. I mean, I think all the analysts that we talked to, including yourself, mentioned that yeah. um, the collision of Snowflake and Databricks is much more of a market optics. The customers are voting with their data, right? I mean, if they stay on Snowflake, they're going to stay in Snowflake because it's easier and the compute's there. If Databricks does its job, it can get Federation to suck the data out of Snowflake, change the economics, then that might be of interest. So the question is, what's the switching cost between yeah. Snowflake and Databricks and vice versa? Uh, that's actually a very interesting point. Uh, you know, speaking of switching costs, right? You know, we always care about switching costs. I do think in the next few years, you know, there will be some layers of technology to lower down or actually uh, allow you to switch easier, right? Because, you know, a lot of times, you know, we, we, we have been talking about data gravity for the last decade, right? Uh, but believe it or not, because of the AI, because of the Jensen Huang's GPU costing so much, actually I believe that, that there is a compute gravity uh, going on right here. So it's a, before it's like a compute moving to the data, I wouldn't be surprised in the next five or 10 years, we want the data moving to, uh, to the compute because, compu I mean, electricity is the scarce resource. The, the, the cooling is the scarce resource. You want data to move there. Now, it's not going to be wholesale move, right? It's about, can you do that incrementally? Can you virtualize the data layer? I do see a number of you know, uh, smaller startups you know, started sending this uh, message. I'm actually quite excited. You know, that's yeah. why I see that there will be a lot of innovation over there. In fact, we had a discussion about that over, over in the other place about delta sharing and when you bring in stuff into Unity Catalog and you're yeah. able to share without moving the data yeah. around, bringing the data to the AI in a location that has lower, lower, you know, more power, lower yeah. cooling costs, yeah. and things like more sustainability, even from Good that. Good that we're speaking the same language yeah. because you know, in the last decade, there is only about data gravity. You know, I do think uh, the the compute gravity is going to be more a theme. Um, to I your think point, you're right, right? Yeah. You know, to your point, right? It's more than just the data. There, there's a lot of the, you know, the data lineage, the the, the, the optimization. So, yeah. so I'm. I'm quite looking forward to the new things. Yeah, and I, th I think the yeah. lineage thing becomes really important because when you get f when you get hallucinations or you get issues within your data, <laughs> yeah. and especially when you go to these comp you know uh, compound systems or complex systems, whatever you want to call them, where you have multiple LLMs involved and multi and other AI, traditional AI, understanding where things went wrong <laughs> becomes really really. Uh, 
difficult. We actually had a session with Harlan uh, from the CTO on Mosaic ML and really talked about the agent, agent framework and how you break down in that. And he said, hey, we kind of, we kind of went backwards and forgot about all of these, this circle of really iterating through because we just said, oh, throw it all at one big model. And it's not going to be about that. And we kind of all got caught up in that. And you know, now we are doing things in more of a way where it's, hey, I have to understand all of these pieces, how they flow. And really, it comes down to where did that data come from and how do I replace I'm it? I'm a huge fan of agents. I think agents are going to be really important. You've been important. talking about it for a while. And, and to your point, if, it's, if, it, if it takes too many steps to do it, in every single inflection point wave that's been important, all the winners were simplified, make it easy, to, intuitive to understand, and reduce the steps it takes to do something. Every Simplicity, single, uniform layer. Every single time. So, your point there, uh -huh. it doesn't get done, if I can't build my app faster than before. Well, and it's all about meeting people where they are. One yeah. of the things that was a the theme of the conversation all week was not just, not just appealing to the lead data scientist within an organization or a specific dev, but actually making it so that everyone can be a data scientist to a degree if they have access to the AI and to their data. The key thing with the generative AI is the AI is being democratized, right? Mm -hmm. AI is being democratized, but the data access is not, right? So I think that's why so many vendors are innovating, how to, you know, I came from virtualization background, so I have to use a virtualization, <laughs> right? Hypervisor. And really, really virtualize the data layer in terms of the data access, you know, the, the, the catalog. So I'm not convinced that that... We call it a hypervisor? A data well, hypervisor? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So well, there's the a end. company called a data, <laughs> uh, data Strato, right? You know, that's sort no, of I mean, another but, layer. But, I mean, joking aside, what you're getting at is, is that this harmonization we talked about on the, our OP day one yesterday with George Gilbert, you get the plumbing right and then the data yeah. harmonizes through interactions. So I think, I, I think we're going to start to see something new we've never seen before. Once people get their lakes set up, once the plumbing is in place, pipelines have AI to it. So I just think that we're in this grind mode right now. You know, things it is gotta gritty. get you gotta wire this together, yeah, yeah, yeah. iceberg with this, mm -hmm. get the formats right. But once that's under the covers mm -hmm. with a hardened top, then it has to get better. I mean, I just don't see I, mean, I like mosaic, I think that's got a great action, but it's still in the you gotta grind it out, knock it down. So whoever nails the simplicity on the agents, <laughs> yeah, will will it will take Think a about lot. the problem statement lot. I mentioned, right? You know, if you want the compute to follow data, there are so many problems you need to solve. So yeah. So there will be some grinding period. I oh, mean. yeah. <laughs> well, it sounds like everyone we talked to, I mean, a lot of the guests we, we talked to are, are seeing a lot of different customers yeah. across verticals, and they spoke about that, exactly. Yeah. We're in that gritty building phase when I ask everyone my, my standard savvy question, what do you hope to be able to say when we're here this time next year that you can't say today? It was all we're at scale with our customers doing X. Yeah. It was less sandbox, more true implementation and, and, and rolling normally it Normally you get different answers. It's normally it's like, hey, you know, I want my life to be easier. Like all the same. Now it's here, it's like it's all about the features, product. Yeah, it was so product heavy in the answers, I thought it was kind of wild. This reminds me of AWS in the early days because you have builders, you have developers here, not corporate. Yeah. I think this is not a sales event in the sense of no, it's it, it, heavy swag, which is an indicator yeah, was, of developers. I was just going to say, it's, <laughs> I was just going to say that it's open source, it's definitely dev heavy, but, but I think exactly to your point, it's less salesy, more community. Right. I and think that in general, the Databricks ecosystem has more developers, and then uh, the um, Snowflake ecosystem has yeah. more enterprise people. Here's my, here's my yeah. take on Databricks right now, and this is, uh, this is gonna, I'm going to watch this very closely. I'm not down on this, but I'm, just, I'm, I'm pointing it out. Databricks has been such a proponent of open source. Everything about Databricks is open source, but they've been very one-sided in their open source. They've been open source heavy on the Databricks side yeah, yeah. as the committers driving the project. Exactly. Which there's nothing wrong with that, but to get true open source, yeah. you have, have to show a lot more non-Databricks well, interaction. Exactly. Otherwise, it's just a Databricks product so, so in what, the open. What I would say is though, the one comment that I, and I said this earlier today in one of our wraps, that 66% of the contributions to Spark are now coming from non-Databricks companies. Spark. But Spark, Spark is Spark. not the core <laughs> yeah. part of the oh, Databricks oh, okay. product at this uh, point. I, I understand. Oh, I'm that's just, a good but, point. But that's I'm, a good but point. I, I think it's a good it, point. It, it, it's an evolution for all of these different pro projects. I think, you know, again, it's, it's a good signal that it could go the other way. My point is, is that yeah. Databricks has to be careful and they have to emphasize and invest in this, just like they're investing in $2 billion in, in Tabular. Open source works only if it goes direction Agreed. of 65%. Otherwise, it's just a Databricks company. 
in the open. So I think that'll be the true test. And if that infiltrates into open source in a positive way, I think the data engineering will have a very Kubernetes-like yeah. effect where, where that stuff happens fast. And the one to watch is Unity Catalog, because that really is the glue at that data, yeah. data layer. Unity Catalog could be a data engineer's dream. Yeah. Um, not so much just, just from the government side, just like, that could be just like, we're going to set up the whole thing, and I predict that you're going to see complete redos. If you look at the math of how much it costs to actually go into an enterprise, take the big enterprise, take a pharma company, anyone say, I'm going to redo the entire data estate from scratch, reset the whole thing from the ground up. If you're a know, hundred million, not mean maybe less. Yeah. I mean, Rob, do the math. Like, but, just, but I mean, again. Don't I, ask Rob to do math. Yeah, <laughs> math, math might be too, too <laughs> far away. Right let me ask open AI. Let me tell you one challenge. Yeah. 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 Careful, Simba. John. It does math now. But, yeah. but, but I, I think, again, <laughs> why I think, I've already, I've already had two different organizations say to me at two different parties this week, I'm really excited to get my hands on the open source Unity catalog to go and see what I can actually do with it and how much of it's actually open source. And I, I think that's, that's the key is what features that they have on top of Unity actually land in the open source versus what pieces are actually Databricks built on yeah. top of Unity. Is that, basically, is that truly, truly open? That's the, that's yes. the question. Well, I, remember, I think the jury's still out. But remember yeah. when Ali went up there yesterday on day one, he said basically the three things on the industry was demand for, demand for AI, check, we all know that, security and privacy, and the fragmented data estates. And again, that speaks to what we know and everyone knows, data's messy, but also organizationally from the data warehouse, old school data warehouse, it's siloed. Mm -hmm. And silo, yeah, silo, it's silo. like, you can't, data's got to yeah. be free to fly around for generate to be <laughs> into in It's gotta be free. It's gotta fly around <laughs> horizontally scalable right. and in the application. But that's not the enterprise yeah. has been set up in the right. last yeah, several decades. Just, no, yeah. not at all. That's it's the opposite of free. The, it's, the, it's yeah. It, the script's flipping. Yeah. So again, hypervisor, I'm just joking, but like that concept of the control plane, interesting, it's yeah. got government yeah. I, 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 you know, I, I hardly believe that a <laughs> unit catalog will be that layer uh, as a starting point of hypervisor. I think people will have some skepticism, they have to prove, there is a lot of work for them to do. So I truly believe that it's not a, you know, just a collision between the snowflake and the data breaks, there will be opportunity for third party to provide a more truly open. Well, when you were at VMware, you wrote one of the early lines of code, first code for the network side, um, when hypervisor, when hypervisor was not even a conversation, was happening. What was the motivation behind that? Was it server? It was obviously server virtualization. But what was the motive? What was the motivation behind the hypervisor? Why did it come about? Well, twenty some years ago, believe it or not, you know, I remember when I went to VMware and I saw the stats. I couldn't believe that worldwide, the server utilization was below five percent across the board. Because Windows, I mean, you give a lot of the CPUs, the Windows was not able to drive, you know, multiple <laughs> CPU. You, I mean, today it's it hard to imagine. This application. is a server, and we're talking about expensive servers. Utilization across the board, not just one company, across the board was less than 5%. So that's the motivation of hypervisor initially, right? To increase, yeah. uh, basically to write an operating system right, basically. And I, I think you have that same thing happening with data. Yeah. It's like how much of my data is actually being utilized. I'm just flooding it in. Yeah, and, fingernail it and, probably yeah, at this point. In theory, exactly. they're all the CPUs, but in reality, are you using it at the same thing with right. data? It's Exa the same thing. Exactly, and how much of it's hot data, how much it's useful data, and we were even talking about hot how data. There hot you go. data. And <laughs> how you could actually, within answers, and within Delta, yeah. Yeah. you could actually go in and take something out from Mosaic using the framework, the AI framework, yeah. and if you deleted it out, it actually, or you deleted it out of Delta, it deleted it out of the actual answers inside of Mosaic, so it would not become and give you a hallucination. But it, again, you go, how many copies of an Excel spreadsheet are somewhere, yeah. and then how do I know which one is the good one? And it's getting where I Data have multiple copies of a Literally. customer support mag, yeah. that, you know, Beat Bolton, and it says, "Hey, this one had the wrong yeah. answers in it." From so there's an opportunity to, to create a mechanism. And remember, the hypervisor helped help create the cloud hyperscalers. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't for a hypervisor. And well, enable the cloud. Have, made, the, made the cloud happen. Yeah, right. Made the cloud happen again. A new thing that popped out of like the web services. So what will pop out of the data yeah. world? So 20 years That's later, hopefully some wonderful so solutions So 20 years for later, humanity. hypervisor is no longer the coolest the word, <laughs> but you know some other word, right? Data straddle, data whatever layer <laughs> will be needed, right? Something to simplify, 
things to unif you know, make things uniform. You know, I think that's We're going to take it back to the Cube research team and we're going to bang out a data visor. Data visor. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to workshop that, folks. Mega, gonna, mega yeah. hyper data visor. A mega hyper. I'm not saying that yeah. live on television, so you're going to have to figure that one out. <laughs> uh, something I thought was cool, just shifting, well actually I want to say one thing, Rob, that you brought up. You brought up the Excel spreadsheets. And I thought it was really interesting when we were at AWS Financial Services Symposium last week, Malcolm DeMaio of NVIDIA was mentioning that the partnership with them and Deloitte popped up because they read a Wall Street Journal article where the quote was, Excel is standing in the way, Excel Excel is the thing standing in the way of, of enterprise AI transformation. And it's like, it's that simple, right? Excel is where everyone's kept their data. It's the worst program, nobody wants to use it. Sorry, spreadsheet lovers, I'm dyslexic. It's literally just a pile of numbers to me. And, and, and so it's really nice to, to see this whole movement towards data. I feel like the data nerds are getting their moment right now. It's, it's such a hot time for data, to, to your point, Rob. And something I thought was really remarkable that we we, we don't have this happen a lot on theCUBE, at least not that I've noticed, was we had two guests on theCUBE, we had Elliot and Andrew, both of their companies are invested in by Databricks. Now this is Databricks who isn't public, to your point earlier, Howie, so it's a very interesting dynamic there where we're seeing some really deliberate investments in the ecosystem and, and you know, talk about putting your money where your community is, quite literally, and, and optimizing for solutions in that way. If you're not going to buy it, help them build it and the partnerships there, you could just see the glowing love they have for Databricks, not just because they're sitting on the show talking to us about it, but because they're actually a true strategic partner, which I thought was was honestly refreshing to see. I it's also a very, It's great. a fine line, it's very hard to, you know, sort of the uh, uh, walk on that line, right? You know, partner versus a builder myself, or buy a company, you know, it's actually pretty right. difficult. They, they, Databricks as a company, they, they need to learn. Yeah. And uh, by the way, when you said, you know, Excel being the, you know, sort of the, uh, in the way or whatnot, I would say the other way around, that data, uh, Excel is actually the motherland of all the innovations, because, you know, think about every single SaaS company, literally a SaaS company, every single SaaS company is a feature of uh, Excel, right? Mm -hmm. Salesforce, Workday, ServiceNow, yeah. they all, right, you know, come right, from, right, right. you know, Excel. So you extract the one functionality out of you, it's a hundred billion dollar SaaS <laughs> company. So, so I, I would, I love, Excel, you know, you, you, you can build so right. many SaaS can, companies. You can do my like Excel at yeah. any time. Well, I mean, one of, my, one of the companies that I <laughs> built out was based on me using macros in Excel and getting sick of doing that and needing a more every, advanced way of doing it. Every company is yes. like that. I, I, so, so Excel Databricks really is just <laughs> Excel on steroids. Yes. 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 Is that what we were trying to say? <laughs> when you have oh, plus AI. Plus, plus AI. AI. Yeah, right. plus AI. Yeah, Jeez. Right. yeah quite, quite literally. One thing I have to point out a little bit on the disappointing side for me, this show, we do a lot of work with women in data science. I know you've been a supporter. Their goals yeah. are to see 30% of women in, represented in data science. We didn't have a single female guest. The only female on the stage this week was me. I tried, and I, I tried. That's not good we enough. We almost had one. We can do better. But she left early. Okay. That's excuses. <laughs> There's, we, there, did a great job. Know, there are, I agree. Thank I you. Agree. And I will I help you in the no, job. I, it matters. Please don't yes. interrupt me right now. What I'm trying to say is for the women watching, there are women in data science. This room has been full of really awesome, powerful women. We saw women in the keynote. I talked to a lot of really awesome women at Boost. There are a lot of powerful women, so don't watch this and just think it's a bunch of bros and Brooks Brothers blue jackets. It's a lot more than that. And, and I know that we can tell those stories. We can get those customer stories here on this stage, and I think it will be awesome. So that's my, what do I want to say this time next year? I want to say that we had 50-50, or at least 30% yeah. women on this stage telling the most important companies in our industry. And on that note, I'm actually going to just say thank you because this thank has been a long segment and, <laughs> and, and I don't know that we can really pivot from that. Thank you. Uh, you're uh, welcome, it's John. It's great hosting with I you guys. I appreciate having you here. Rob, great yes. work. Come on, thank you. the thank you. angles. Yes. Great job. Really, yeah. really wonderful. Great job for the team. Well done, guys. Working with all of you. I was just going to say that this wonderful group of well-hatted hotties over there just crushing it. As <laughs> always, we cherish you and you making us look good for the guests and for my own vanity when I rewatch every single segment because that's what I do. Also want to give a shout out to all of you who are watching. It's Pride Month. Happy Pride. We're proud allies up here. I've got my rainbows in the ears, friends. And without you tuning in, we don't get to sit here and learn from the smartest people on earth. We're at Databricks Data and AI Summit, signing off for the last time here in San Francisco, California. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.